your children and don't let them fall by the side the road. Teach them to love one another that heaven might find find a place in the heart cause Jesus he is love he won't let you down
So again, that's abiding love we're going to be talking about this morning out of the Gospel of John. It's in the New Testament, chapter 15, beginning in verse 4 all the way up to verse 17. So I'm going to go ahead and pray this morning, and then we're going to go ahead and um, get started with our lesson. Father God, we thank you this morning just for all that you have done and all that you are in the process of doing. Lord, we thank you for being a head of protection around your children as we travel to and from this week. Lord, I thank you for being a head of protection around our minds, Lord, as uh, the, the world may have been in confusion this week, Lord, but we know that the people of God, the body of Christ, Lord, we have had our faith in you, Father God, for we know that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and Lord, it doesn't matter who is in office, Lord, but we know that you govern your people, Father God, that you are the maker of this world, and Father, that you are still in control, that you are almighty, that you are all powerful, Father God. We thank you for just being God today. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon us, Father God. We thank you for food on our table and clothes on our back and money in our pockets, Father God. Even in the midst of a pandemic, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for continuing to uh, provide for us and be a provider, Father God. We thank you for your healing power this morning, Father God. We pray that you would just step into the hospital rooms this morning, Father God. Whoever it is that stands in need of healing this morning, Father, we pray that you would just be a hand of protection around them, Father God, and touch them in a special way this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we get ready to dive into your word and learn more about who you've called us to be, Father God, and learn more about how we can better please you and bring glory to the Father. Father, we ask that you just enter into the wounds where the people are watching right now, Father God, as we get ready to dive into your word, Father God, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, Lord, that we may receive the word that you have in store for us, Father God, I pray that the word would be planted. And, and, and that it would uh, be planted on good soil this morning, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, so that we may go out and reap a harvest, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you right now, Father God. And now, Lord, I pray that you would just step into the midst of this tabernacle, Father God, and have your way, Father God. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing in your sight, Father God. And not only that, but Lord, I pray that you would help me to decrease as you increase, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We pray, we say thank you, Lord, and amen. Abiding love, abiding love. Coming out of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 4 through 17. We're going to be reading from the NIV version, and it reads, beginning in the fourth verse, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Again, that's coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 15 beginning in the fourth verse all the way to the 17th verse. And, and again, we're talking about abiding 
love today, this Sunday school, in the Sunday school lesson, abiding love. And in the background of the lesson today, um, as I stated, this is the Gospel of John. I know some of you may be wondering, okay, who is John? Well, not John the Baptist, but this is John the Apostle, one of the apostles, one of the 12 apostles, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is John the self penned the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and I like that he calls himself that because if we be true, if we be honest with ourselves, that's how we all should feel, that we are the one who Jesus loved. As the song said this morning, Jesus is love, and we know that all that he came to do was because of God's love for us. So we're all disciples. We're all followers of Christ who Jesus loves. Amen? But so we know it's the, uh, the Gospel of John. We know that John was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, he walked with Jesus wherever he went. Uh, uh, James, John, and Peter. Everywhere that Jesus went. But, but, but what was the purpose of John's gospel? The purpose of John's gospel was to prove that Jesus is the Son of God and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. And, and out of all the gospels, John is my favorite because we get verses like, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And not only that, but we get uh, the verse that, the first verse that I ever learned, and the first verse that a lot of you probably learned uh, in your journey with Christ, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I found one of, one of the scriptures that is the, uh, that sets the foundation for what we believe, John 3, 16. So that was the purpose of John's gospel, to prove who Jesus is and who Jesus still is today. And, 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 and who was John's gospel written to? It was written to the Gentiles at the time. It was written to people who were not followers of Christ and also to people who were new believers or new followers of Christ so that they would have a greater understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Amen? So we know whose gospel this is. We know who penned this gospel. But who is speaking to us here in the text? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus is speaking to the disciples here in the text. And what I found interesting as I was studying the lesson and preparing this week was that um, was, was the setting, the setting of uh, the, when this conversation is taking place. Yeah, the setting. What was the setting? The setting the setting was, uh, you have to know that this was the disciples' last moments with Jesus. One of, this was the last moments with him before he would be crucified. And as I studied and I prepared this week, I, I began to ask myself, how many of us would spend our last few moments training or preparing someone else? These were the last few hours before Jesus would be beaten all night long and would be on his way to Calvary to be crucified for the world. And yet Jesus, knowing, all-knowing, Jesus all-knowing still made time, still found time in the midst of difficult circumstances because could you imagine his mindset at the time as he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane? They were leaving the Last Supper table and they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane and he knows in his mind, all-knowing Jesus, knows what is coming next. And yet he still made time, yet he has still made up his mind that there is no time that can be wasted. I must train the disciples. I must make sure that I continue to encourage them. I must make sure that I continue to set an example before them that even in difficult circumstances, we must still serve, we must still love one another. And as I studied, I looked back and I realized that he, he, he not only speaking, he's not only speaking to the disciples as they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, but if you look back in the chapters leading into uh, John chapter 15, you see that Jesus not only is just teaching here, but he had to wash the feet of the disciples all of this before he, he would soon be crucified. Not just one disciple, but all the disciples. And we know that Judas was a disciple, and uh, Judas would soon betray Jesus in just a few hours. And that, that ministry. 
minister to me, and I believe that that should serve as an example to each and every one of us today that no matter what we're facing, no matter what the circumstance is, uh, we should be like Jesus and still uh, uh, not feel like we're above serving. No matter who it is, we shouldn't feel like we're above loving. We shouldn't feel like we're above serving no matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstance is. If Jesus, all knowing, knowing what he was about to go through, could still serve the disciples, serve someone who was about to betray him, and still take the time out to uh, prepare the disciples, making sure that they knew uh, the importance and explaining to them the importance of having a relationship with God. And I just question myself, and I, I ask us to question ourselves, how many of us would uh, spend our last moments preparing others, explaining to others how to have a relationship with God? I know we often get the question, or we often uh, find ourselves, you know, uh, what would you do with your last few days if you knew you were going to die the next few days, or the next few months, or the next few hours, if you only knew you had a few hours Remaining. And I know some of our answers know I'm spending all my money. I'm, I'm taking a trip. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But how many of us would spend that time ministering to others, preparing others, and explaining to them the importance of uh, having a relationship with God? That's Jesus. Jesus is love. We're talking about an abiding love this morning, a love that doesn't depart, a love that remains, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Jesus did not depart, he did not love. And you have to, you have to remember that uh, not only that, but he is still ministering, he's still preparing these individuals who would uh, uh, betray him and who would uh, turn their backs on him and leave him by himself to endure the cross and uh, to be beaten all night long and uh, to be denied three times by Peter. These same individuals, Jesus still took the time and made the time as he's getting ready to endure all of this to prepare them. Something to think about this morning. My mama. So they're leaving the Last Supper and they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus begins to teach them. He begins to explain the importance of the relationship we must have with God the Father with him and uh, with one another as we see here in the text. And he begins to explain and to deliver the secrets of a successful, of a productive, of a fruitful life as a follower of Christ. And as we see here in the text, and I'm going to read the first, uh, the first three verses because I believe they are very Bible, although they aren't a part of the lesson. I feel like they're very vital and uh, getting a greater grasp of what is going on here in this conversation that he's having with the disciples. In the first three verses, uh, Jesus, as they're leaving the last supper table and they're on their way to the garden, he says, I am the true vine, verse 1, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. He says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. But then we get to verse four and it says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And as we go on through uh, verse four through eight, uh, one of the things that stands out is we see, uh, we see the benefit of God the Father's provision, right? We see the benefit of God the Father's provision. What is his provision? His provision is the vine, his son, Jesus Christ. We see uh, the benefit of his provision, who is Jesus Christ. We ought to thank God that uh, he has provided us so much today. I know we get caught up in uh, the things that we have in front of us today, but we wouldn't have any of that had it not been for the vine, had it not been for Jesus Christ. Amen? So we see the benefit of his provision, who is uh, the Son, Jesus Christ. And he says in verse, he says in verse 4, remain in me as I also remain in you, but no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, 
can you bear fruit unless you remain in me? Cannot bear fruit unless we remain in him. Cannot have a productive a productive life or a life that is uh, beneficial to God or that glorifies God unless we remain in Christ. We can act in our own power. We can act in our own power. But our actions cannot bear fruit for God when we act in our own power. He says in uh, verse 6, he says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Apart from Christ, we are helpless in trying to do good works or do works of God that will please Him. Because if we're not in the, if we're not in the tree, we're not in the vine. Uh, we are literally just a branch. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a branch that was not on a tree that produced any fruit. It's just a dead branch. And that's what Jesus is getting to us today. He's saying that apart from me, you can't do anything that's going to benefit the kingdom of God. You can't do anything that's going to bear fruit. It's only by being in Christ, by abiding in him, remaining in him, that we can do anything that's going to be beneficial to the kingdom of God and that is going to bear fruit for others. Because, that, And we're going to talk about it in a moment, but the fruit that we bear in our lives is not for ourselves. It's not for ourselves at all. We're going to come back to that. But, but we see the benefits of his provision. We see the benefits of remaining in the vine. The benefits of the Father's provision of remaining in the vine. What are the benefits of remaining in his provision, remaining in the vine, remaining in Christ? The first benefit that we see is that uh, we, we are pruned, we are cleaned. Verse 2 says, he cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And the word prune can also mean cleaned. He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. What, it, what do you mean he prunes? He cleans if we remain in Christ. Well, it's simple. Just like it says in Romans chapter 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to the ways of this world. By being in this world, we, we, we pick up a lot of attitudes, we pick up a lot of uh, practices that aren't necessarily of God's word, that are, not, that are not necessarily from God, right? I spent a lot of time, or I spent a lot of time this past summer with my grandmother uh, in her garden. She was showing me how to make greens, Colorado greens, and um, one of the things that she would do when she'd go out to her garden is uh, she would prune or clean the leaves, right? She would prune or, or clean the leaves uh, because if she didn't, they would go bad, right? So she has to continue to uh, prune, she has to continue to clean the leaves so that they will be uh, fruitful, that they will provide some nourishment to whoever she's going to cook the greens for, whoever she's uh, going to give the tomatoes to, whatever it may have been in her garden. And I found it interesting because one time she, she and I were having a conversation uh, she said one of her neighbors uh, would often ask how she got her, her plants to grow so tall and to uh, be so fruitful. And she said, you know, you just have to talk to your plants. You have to talk to what's in the garden. She said, oh, that's all she really does. She just talks to her plants. She talks to her tomato plants. She talks to her, uh, her greens, and, and they grow. And I thought about that and ministered to me because um, a lot of us are living fruitful lives. And you have people that are coming to you and ask you, how, 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 did you, how is your life so fruitful? Or, or uh, how are you doing this? Or uh, what, what, what are you doing to get here and get there? And the truth of the matter is, it's nothing that we're doing. It's the fact that we're spending a little time where the Father is just speaking to us. The gardener is just coming to speak to us. He's pruning and he's cleaning us. Uh, as it says in verse 1, it says, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. So the next time somebody comes up to you and asks you, uh, what are you doing that's so different or, 
or what makes you so different or, or why, why is it that your life seems so fruitful, so productive? Why is it that your life seems so peaceful? Why is it that your life, uh, uh, why is it that you are able to show so much love and love your enemies? And, and what is it about you? It's the fact that the father, the gardener, is coming out to prune and clean me and he's speaking to me and I'm spending time in his word. When was the last time that you spent some time in God's word? Spend some time with the Father. Let his word speak to you and minister to you. Fruitful life. People try to figure out why your, why your life's so fruitful. Why your, why, why your children are so fruitful. It's because of the God that you serve. He so said he speaks to me. He speaks to me through his word. We've got to get in that word. See the benefits of remaining in Christ. Says it bear fruit. Be a fruitful. Fruitful life, amen? So one of the benefits of remaining in the vine is that you're pruned, you're clean. One of the other benefits is that you're not cast into the fire and burned, amen? Not cast into the fire and burned. You're not unproductive. You're not falling off when you remain in the vine. Fruitful. Fruitful life. Productive life. The third benefit that we see is Answered prayer. Right? The third benefit that we see is answered prayer. It says in verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I have to break this down because I know a lot of people, I say there's a lot of things that I ask for, Lord, and I ain't got them yet. Or right? it seems like it's come to pass. You know, I ask for this, I ask for that, but it ain't come to pass. What's up? You said, you said in verse 7, if you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it'll be done. What's up with that, Lord? What's going on? What's going on? What's up with that? And what we have to realize is that prayer is not like rubbing on a genie lamp like Aladdin and asking and getting your three wishes or asking for unlimited wishes or anything like that. That's not what prayer is. And, and the thing about it is when our prayer is not answered, I've learned that when our prayer is not answered, it doesn't mean that we're not abiding in Christ. It may just be it may just not be the proper time. It, it may just be God saying, not right now. Or it could be that you are not in God's will. Whatever you're asking for is not in God's will. Abiding in Christ includes being in his will. When you're in the vine, you're in his will. You're conforming to the will of God. What we ask for in prayer must be in the will of God before it can be fulfilled. What you have to look at in verse 7 is the key words. There are key words. It says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Right? So if his word is in you, you're not going to ask for anything that goes against his will. When we're connected in spirit and his word will pray faith and receive what we ask for. Receiving because our will has to form to Christ's will because now we are aligned with his word. So we see those benefits of this provision. We see those benefits of remaining in the vine. But we also see an important quality of, of remaining in the vine. We also see an important quality of its provision. And a lot of us may think it's a benefit, but really it's an important quality because it's not beneficial to us. It is a benefit, but it's not beneficial to us. It's beneficial to those around us. It's beneficial to the kingdom of God. And what is that? What is that? What is that provision? What is that benefit? What is that important quality? It's a fruitful life. It's a fruitful life. Verse eight says, "All of this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." That's an important. That's that's an important quality of the provision that he's of, that, of the provision of. The vine that he's given us. The fruitful life. It's how God gets glory from us. Right? Our fruit is not for ourselves, but it's for others. Those tomatoes that my that my grandmother grows, those, those uh, collard green leaves that she grows, it's not for the benefit of the plant. It's not for the benefit of the garden, but it's for uh, the person who's going to take part in getting nourishment from those items. Right? So the same things in our life, those the fruitful, the fruit that we bear from remaining in Christ, love, peace, joy, 
patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faith. Those fruits that we bear, it's not for our benefit, but it's for the benefit of those around us. It's, it's so that God can get glory from our lives. Amen? So we see the benefits of the Father's provision, but we also see what it means to abide in his love. Verses 9 through 11, we see, we see what it means to abide in Christ's love, to remain in Christ, to abide in his love, to remain in his love. He says in verse 9 through 11, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Verse 11, he says, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Remain in his love, he says. He says, remain in my love. What does his love for us look like? And he said, verse 9, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So what does his love look like? What does his love for us look like? It looks like the Father's love. What does the Father's love for Christ look like? It looks like provision. It looks like wisdom. It looks like answered prayer. Provision. Everywhere that Jesus went, all of his needs were provided. Were they not? Wisdom, 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 wisdom. Where do we see wisdom? Where do we see that God has provided Jesus with wisdom? If we drop down to verse 15, and we're going to come back to this, but if we drop down to verse 15 real quick, I just want to show you this. It says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, the wisdom that I got from my father, everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. What does his love look like? Like the father's love for him. Provision. Wisdom, answered prayer. How do we remain in his love? He says in verse 8, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 10. He says, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I once heard a preacher say, he says, Jesus will never ask us to do something that he himself has not done. And we see that here in verse 10. It says, just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. He'll never ask us to do something he himself has not already done. What is his command? What is his command? We see it in verse 12. He says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. He says, love each other as I have loved you. Again, I'll say that again. Love one another as he has loved us. Because you see, by being in the vine, by being in the vine, we have a portion of God's love to share with others. Yet by being in the vine, we have a portion of God's love to share with others because God is love. And, and, and you can see that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It says, uh, anyone who does not know love does not know God because God is love. So if God is love and if we're in the same vine, if we're in that vine, we now, we now have a portion of God's love. And we're not just called to hold on to that love, but in having a fruitful life, we're called to share that love with others. As branches, think about a tree, the vine, and the branches. As branches, we are extensions of God's love to those who may be unaware or blind to God's love. I'll say that again. As branches, as branches, he's the vine, we are the branch. As branches, we are extensions of God's love to those who may be unaware or blind to God's love. That's one of the importances of, of loving our enemies that Sister Hick talked about last month. 
Because Christ can be revealed to uh, someone just by our actions of loving them in spite of. May not even be your enemy, or even if it is the enemy of the person who's mistreated you, or uh, the person who may be currently mistreating you. God may be revealed to them by the fact that you continue to show them love in spite of it. Even if, even if he's not revealed to them, God may be revealed to someone who may be in the midst of the situation or who may be uh, watching the uh, situation unfold. Because the world is always watching the body of Christ. They say, okay, I see you wear that Mount Vernon mask. I see you wear that Mount Vernon t-shirt. I see you wear that trust God and chill hat. I see you wear that God is dope t-shirt. But let's see how he uh, reacts in this situation. We continue to love people in spite of. The world is watching the body of Christ. It's important that we make sure that we love, we're loving one another and extending that love that Christ has shared with us. Amen? It's important, it's important that as branches we extend God's love to others, those who may be blind to his love or blind to what Jesus came to do. But in verse, verse 11 it says, in verse 11 he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He says, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. What does he mean? That your joy may be complete. Well, everybody can have joy in the good times, right? We all, we all have joy in the good times, but what about the bad times? What about when we've lost a loved one? What about when in that season of unemployment? What about in that season of a pandemic? Where I can't go to school, I can't be around my friends or my loved ones. I can't travel to see my loved ones in the holidays. Anybody can have joy in the good times, but Jesus says, remain in me. He said, your joy will be complete. So you have joy in the good times and the bad times. No matter the circumstance because of your relationship with Christ. You'll have joy no matter happy or sad, good or bad. You'll have joy. Your joy will be complete. Why will my joy be complete? Because I know that all things are working together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Not only that, but I know that even in the loss of a loved one, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know that all things work together for my good. I know that Jesus is a very present help. God is a very present help in the time of trouble. So even in the bad times, I still have joy. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes, sir. No matter the circumstance, yes. good or bad, I still can have joy because I'm in the body. So my joy is complete because I know who Christ is. I know what he did for me. So even in the bad times, I can look ahead to know that it won't always be like this. Sooner or later, turn in my favor. It's turned around for me. Thank you for Sean Mitchell. We have songs like, I still have joy. After all, after all the things that I've been doing, thank God I still, still have joy. That's why we can have songs like that, because we know that our joy has been made complete when we become grafted into the vine of Jesus Christ. My, 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 my. Songs like, uh, this joy that I have, the world didn't get it, the world can't take it away because I'm in the vine. I'm in his love. Amen? But not only do we see an abiding and abide, uh, abiding in Jesus' love, the benefits thereof, but now we see that um, in verse, as we get to verse 12 and we're getting ready to close this thing out, we see uh, what it takes and we see what it means to abide as a friend of God, abide as Jesus' friend, to remain his friend. Verse 12, verse 13, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's, one's life, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. 15, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. He says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you 
so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. He ends and he says, this is my command, love each other. Love each other. And in verse 13, he says, greater love has no one in this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And what you have to keep in mind is as he's saying this, he is literally on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. To, be, to soon be betrayed, to soon be beaten all night long, and to have to endure the, the cross at Calvary. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Knowing that they would turn their backs on him, that they would disperse, that Peter was going to deny him three times, that Judas was going to be the one that he had already left the table with, knowing that Judas was going to be the one that was betraying him. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. But watch verse 14. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. He was sent for the world, but when we disregard his command to love one another as he had loved us, because that, that's what the command is. If you do what I command, love one another as I have loved you. So he was sent for the world when we disregard his command, we disregard his love and make everything that he did in vain. When we disregard his love, we make everything that he did in vain. Why? Because we aren't showing ourselves to be friends of God if we fail to love one another as he has loved us. And the question that I ask, I want to ask some of us today is, are we willing to lay down our life plans? Are we willing to lay down our agendas for Jesus' purpose, for what will bring God glory? Are we willing to do what he commanded us in spite of what the world may say? Are we willing to love one another as he has loved us in spite of what the world says, how the world says we should respond? Even when it's difficult, even when we don't want to, are we truly willing to love one another as he has loved us? When it goes against what our flesh says, when it goes against how the world says we should respond, are we truly, are we truly um, willing to lay down our lives and our own agendas? To love one another as he has loved us. To truly be a friend of Christ. And the truth is, I know that may be difficult for some of us to understand because we've all been hurt. We've all been mistreated. The truth of the matter is that we've all mistreated somebody, amen? We've all hurt someone, whether we want to admit it or not, whether it was intentional or unintentional. We've all mistreated somebody. We've all hurt someone. You say, I haven't hurt anybody. I haven't mistreated anybody. I'm in the, I'm in the mind. You weren't always in the mind. We were grafted in, as it says in Romans. We were grafted into the tree. And James chapter 4, verse 4 tells us that friendship with the world means enmity against God. And that anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. At one point, we were all friends of the world. You weren't always a baptized believer. You weren't always teaching Sunday school. You weren't always up at the front singing hymns. You weren't always in the pulpit preaching and praying. You was a friend of the world at one point before Jesus came into your life. Amen? We've all been friends with the world, which means we were at one point an enemy of God. What does it mean that we were friends with the world? It means that we had conformed to the world's ways. We had forgotten that we are in this world, but not of it. And you have to remember that the word says, do not conform to the ways of this world. We renewed by the, we be renewed, but, but you be transformed, be renewed in your mind. How do we do that? By being in this word. Read our devotion, read the scripture every day to make sure that we're not being transformed by the ways of this world. We're not conforming to the world. We're making sure that we're aligned with God's word, that we're remaining in the mind. We've all hurt somebody. Even if you don't think you did, you hurt Christ. He went and came to 
do a deed for us. Came and do a deed for us. So even if you don't think you've hurt anybody, you hurt Christ. He was beaten all night for you, for me. He went to the cross for you, for me. We've all mistreated somebody. And all he's asking us to do is just love one another as he has loved us in spite of. In spite of when we were going against his word. In spite of when we were friends with the world. Romans 5 and 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Great love has no one in this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Are we willing to lay down our own agenda, our own, uh, our own plans for our life to uh, pursue God's purpose for us, to pursue what will bring God glory, just simply just love one another as he's loved us. Abide in love we're talking about this morning. The last, one of the last benefits we see in this text today is that by remaining in the bond, we see that he calls us friends. Calls us his friends. By simply just loving one another, he calls us his friends. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful this morning that he's revealed so much through his son Jesus Christ to us. That's what makes us his friends. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. Just in his word, he's made so much known to us. That's what makes us friends. Because of what he had came to do for us. It's one of the last benefits we see of being in the Bible. We're his friends. Not servants, not slaves. He calls us friends. He ends it off in verse 17. He says, this is my command. He says, love each other. Some people just love each other. And as I, as I studied the lesson, as I prepared, I'm getting ready to close. As I, as I studied the lesson, I prepared one of the commentaries that talks about how the New Testament talks about loving one another so much. It's constantly emphasized throughout the Gospels, through all throughout the New Testament to love one another as Christ has loved us. And they said that, they said that the reason why they believe it's emphasized so much is because it requires the greatest surrender and sacrifice. Because it's difficult to love. It's difficult to love some people. It's difficult to love some people. Let's be honest, it's difficult. I, I, it's, I find it difficult to love myself someday if I'm, if I'm being honest about the truth. And I know some of you may feel that way as well. Sometimes it's difficult just to love yourself. I know I'm not the easiest person to deal with in the world. I know. I know I'm not the easiest person to deal with within the world. So I know it can be difficult to love others at times. And I believe that's why it's emphasized so much. I agree with the commentators that it's, 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 that's why it's emphasized so much because it requires great surrender. It requires great sacrifice. To love one another in spite of. It's one of the hardest things to do. Because it mostly resembles Christ, right? Out of all the things that he asked us to do, that's the hardest thing because that mostly resembles Christ. How he loved us in spite of. How he went to the cross for us in spite of. How he let them beat on him all night in spite of. How he let them spit on him in spite of. In spite of. How he let them talk mess to him while he was on the cross in spite of. Because of love. Because of love. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to do. But with prayer and with remaining in his word and remaining in the mind, I believe it gets easier each and every day. I'm just a witness that it gets a little easier each and every day. You have a little bit more resistance from one another. Uh, cuts out the person who cuts you off and track. It gets a little easier every day. It gets a little easier to love the people who get a little too close to you in the grocery store. It gets a little easier. I still love you, but you keep your six feet. It gets a little easier to just love those people. To love those people who uh, slander us and mistreat us. It gets a little easier when we just remain in God's word and 
we are constantly reminded of the fact that he loved us in spite of. He loved us in spite of. And that's all that he's asking for us to remain his friends, to remain in his love, to remain, to abide in his love. There's a quote that's often used. It says, show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. It says, show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. And I want to close with that because, again, it says, show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. And if God is, if God, if all God is asking of us is just to love one another as he's loved us, and that's what uh, will keep us as his friends. My question to some of us as we go on throughout the week, um, and I just want us to reflect on this, is that would others be able to identify or tell something about the God that we serve? Or tell something about Christ, one of the characteristics of Christ, simply by how you live your life? I just want to leave that with you. Would others be able to tell something about Jesus, tell something about the God we serve, based on how we live our life, how we love others. Are we just loving the people who um, are in our family or are we loving everybody, loving our enemies? Talked about an abiding love today. I just want you to take that with you this week. Take that with you this week. I hope that this lesson has ministered to you. I hope that you got something out of this about an abiding love. I hope that you got something about the benefits of his provision, of his son Jesus Christ and the Bible. I hope that you got something out of all of this today. So I'm going to close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for all that you are in the process of doing. We thank you for your word, which is tried, proven, and flawless, Father God. We thank you right now. I pray, Lord, that this word is ministered to the hearts of your people this morning, Father God. I pray that as we go on throughout the week, Lord, that we continue to love one another as you have loved us, Father God, in spite of, in spite of our sins, in spite of our faults, in spite of the many times that we turned our backs on you, Father. I pray that you help us to continue to extend the same love and grace and mercy that you've extended to us. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your favor, for your mercy that continues to uh, 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 fall upon us each and every day, that is new each and every morning. Now, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you just enter into the homes of your people, Father God, and invade their spaces, Lord, as we prepare for uh, early morning, not early morning, but just morning worship, Father God, today. Um, I pray that you open our hearts to receive what the man of God has for us today. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, touch him and anoint him in a special way, Father God, to deliver the word uh, in a way that is going to change hearts, in a way that is going to change minds and transform minds, Father God, and renew minds, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you this day, for this day. We thank you for waking us up and starting us on our way. We thank you for the activities of our limbs, Father God. We thank you. Thank you, Father, just for being God. And now, Lord, as we leave this place, we never your presence. We ask that you just continue to be in our midst, Father God. Continue to be at the protection around us as we travel to and from. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, my friend. I uh, look forward to uh, worshiping with each and every one of you as we get ready for morning worship. Amen. God bless you.